I could not be more excited to welcome you to part one of an incredible series where we're going to jump into low variance arena sound system design and optimization. Uh, I'm so happy to have Michael Lawrence to share his work with me as we walk through how he designs, processes, and uh, aligns and tunes arena level systems. Just in case you're not familiar with Michael Lawrence's work, he is a senior instructor at Rational Acoustics. They make the system analysis software smart. He is a technical editor from multiple Live Sound magazines. He's worked with multiple A level artists, and sometimes he gets asked to co host AES panels with Bob McCarthy, the godfather of our craft. I'm so grateful to have him as a friend and mentor and share with us today how he uh, his design process not only applies to arena sized rigs, but his, his concepts can all trickle down to smaller gigs, even if it's just a couple of speakers on a stick. If you want to really dive more into that, I would definitely check out his book. It is amazing. He just released it about a month ago as of the recording of this video. You can get it at the link below or at precisionaudioservices.com slash book. And lastly, uh, if you just want to enter to win a digital copy of this book, all you have to do is comment below with your biggest takeaway from the video. Um, it's going to only be one. I'm sure you're going to have to like comment 17 times because you're going to learn so much, but uh, just leave a comment below with what you learned. Uh, me and Michael both would love to, to hear what's resonating with you. And at, at the end of the part three of the series, we will reply to your comment uh, and you can we can get in contact and make sure you get that code to get the ebook. Anyway, I'm so excited to jump in uh, to the series and share it with you. Here we go. Michael, thank you so much for being with us today. We are incredibly excited to hear about your arena tour, how you managed to wrangle like a hundred something boxes in the air, but you're going to break it down for us into three parts of your low variance arena analysis design and optimization approach. So today is just part one design. So let's jump right into that. I want you to share all the cheat codes about how to make it a system <laughs> sound great before you put it in there, right? Before you put it in the air. Sure. And, you know, obviously that's, that's sort of the real, that's where the work's actually done, right? And that. a lot of people think that, you know, that we're going to fix it in the in the mastering, right? Like we're going to just put some magical EQ on this thing when it's up and that'll sort it out. But, but uh, you know, hopefully as we'll see as, as we go through this, this is where the legwork happens. This is where the good decisions are made. And, and if you do this right, by the time it's in the air and you turn it on, you should be very close to where you need to be. And that's, that's the goal here. That's what we're talking about today. I love it. Cool. So uh, let's let's hop in here. So we talked about low variance. You just said low variance. That's sort of the whole uh, idea here that's driving this entire conversation that we're going to have. Uh, so I think we should start by talking about variance. What is variance, right? Um, so variance is how much the response of your system changes over the listening area. Um, and so obviously we're trying to design a system that's as consistent as possible. It's as low variance as possible. Um, there are... Uh, different ways to quantify that. We're really focused on two, and these are sort of the majority shareholders for this type of work. Um, the first one is level variance, and that's exactly what it sounds like. You know, how, how consistent is the level of the system over the space? Is it louder in the front row and is quieter in the back row? Level variance. Um, and then spectral variance, or sometimes I'll, I'll call it tonal variance as well. And that's, uh, you know, how, how consistent is the tonality of the system over the space? You know, is it, is it, uh, more bass heavy in the front or is it more thin sounding and bright in the back, stuff like that. So, so we talk about a low variance design. We're trying to inherently minimize both of those things. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So you want the front row and the nosebleeds to walk away, both feel like they had a great show. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so that's done in, in, in basically three, three portions here that we're going to talk about uh, design the processing and the alignment of the system. And obviously, like you said, today we're talking about the first part. And that's honestly, that's the lion's share of this discussion, right? That's where most mm -hmm. of this work happens. I would say that that design and processing should get you 92% of the way there. Um, we're going to add the last one dB, right? And oh. uh, in the alignment <laughs> stage. Um, so, so that's kind of what we're talking about. So let's talk about the design. Let's start where we start from this. And, and we start as always with understanding the show understanding the director from the audience. What is the artist trying to communicate? Um, and what do they want? And in this particular instance, we're dealing with artists, working for artists who prioritize the audience experience above all else. Mm -hmm. um, so what I mean by that, one example is a lot of things that I would typically do when I design a system to keep energy off the stage uh, and to be very 
very directed into the audience area to try to keep the stage wash to a minimum and, and keep that experience clean on stage. Um, and coming from the artist's directive here is that we don't care about that. We're willing to have more energy on stage if it makes things more consistent up front. So we want you to do as much as you can do to um, have that consistency in the house. Uh, and we're going to make that our top priority. Um, and, you know, the other interesting thing is you do have artists who kind of want to feel a little bit of energy on stage. So sometimes that's that's not what you want. Right. But in this case, the, the, the goal really is we want to have this thing sound the same in every seat as much as we can. Um, and, and that's going to be our first priority, which is great. You know, that's cool. That's that's a really uh, admirable thing coming from the artist. They, they really want the audience members to experience that that product that they've put together. Um, and And so sort of another way of thinking about the same idea. If we say we want this show to sound the same everywhere, we want the system coverage to be consistent everywhere. Another way to think about that is by saying that the system should have similar coverage shape at all frequencies. And, and that's the same thing, but it's a different way of thinking about it that maybe you're not as used to thinking about it in that way, right? If you think about a single loudspeaker and the shape that it makes at 80 Hertz and the shape that it makes at 4K, those are very different shapes. And so that means that since those are very different shapes, if we move around in that coverage area, we're gonna hear shifting tonal balance and shifting, shifting level. And so what we're really trying to do is have a system that makes the same shape over frequency and that's gonna allow the coverage to be consistent. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely, that, that was probably one of the biggest takeaways from from your book that I got was like, how could you make sure that the full spectrum within what you have control over is equal everywhere? I, I've been such laser focused on, you know, the nominal speaker coverage area of like 1K to 4K, 8K, that K area, and not really like, oh, wow, I can really steer low end if I have the tools to do it. And, and thankfully, in this tour, you were given those tools to do it, which will walk us through. But uh, I love that just matching the cover shape across all frequencies, but there's different ways to get there, right? Because high and low frequencies behave different. Exactly. And that's and that's sort of the, the crux of, of the design process is paying attention to those differences. Because like you said, we can, it's relatively easy to make 4K consistent. Yeah. Um, but if but if your low end is not consistent, that system doesn't sound consistent. Yep. Because you have consistent high end, but you have inconsistent low end. So you have a lot of shifting tonality as you walk around. And so you're really only dealing with half of the puzzle. And in a lot of cases, you're kind of working against yourself. So um, absolutely, it, it, you know, it is a different ballgame at, at lower frequencies. Um, so in order to design a system that has a similar coverage shape at all frequencies, we really have two main weapons at our disposal. The first one is, is the line length. Um, mm -hmm. And we're going to take a look at that. That's a lot of what we're going to talk about today sure. is line length and what that does to allow us to put that low frequency energy where we want it to go. Um, and then processing granularity. And, and what I mean by that is we don't have six or eight or 10 boxes all on the same output from the processors. We have one or two. So we have the ability to do box per box zone per zone operations. And it gives us a higher level of control, um, both at high frequencies and at low frequencies. You know, in high frequencies, we can talk about the the different high frequency EQ shadings that we're going to use to make mm -hmm. the high frequency coverage more consistent. And when we talk about having processing granularity at low frequencies, which, you know, pretty much all the major vendors on a modern system now, uh, you're talking about one or two box zones for the most part, or, or if it's a you know a system that's powered by amplifiers, it's one or two boxes per amplifier. And that allows manufacturers to do their proprietary different beam steering things that they have. They're aimed exactly at addressing this thing where we're talking about getting that directivity at lower frequencies and getting that energy to go where we want. And we're going to take a look at that today. So we don't need to, we don't need to talk about it hypothetically because we're going to, we're going to see it. I love it. Um, yeah. So, so let's talk about this line length idea. So what I've got here is this is what we call a section view or it's a side view uh, of a typical arena. Uh, and so you see, we've got the floor and then you've got the kind of the 100 level rake and then you've got the 200 level rake. And so we're going to consider that a just generic arena seating shape slice. Um, and what I've thrown in as three, three elements of Myers. This is a Meyer Leo cabinet. It's their, it's their large format cabinet that we had on this tour. And I want to be clear. We're talking about Meyer speakers because this, this, that's what we had on this run. Mm -hmm. um, you can, the, the physics that we're going to look at right now are not manufacturer dependent. They don't care what the logo is on the front of the box. We're talking about the math of, of why these sources interact the way they do. So that's what we're talking about. So let's look at low frequencies. Here's three boxes. Here's our shape that we're trying to cover, right? So that mm -hmm. the, the red arrow shows the, the top and the bottom that forms a coverage angle. And when we're done with our design, 
the high frequencies of our system are going to be directed into that angle because that's where our listeners are. Yep. So ideally, we want to create a system that also directs the low frequencies of its output into that same coverage angle. Okay. So if we predict those three boxes at 125 hertz, um, you can see that it's not exactly omnidirectional. We do have kind of like a little squished kidney bean shape going out. Okay. But, you know, each of these colors is 3 dB. So we have a pretty significant level drop off from front to back, right? So three, six, nine, so it's 12 dB front to back level variance at 125 hertz, uh, which is a lot. Right. That's that's more than we want, certainly. And what we really want to do is we want to stretch that lobe out and we want to give it more directionality. And so the way that we do that is we make our line longer. So if we go from three boxes, let's double the length of the line. Here's six boxes again at 125 hertz. Um, and you can see that that lobe has gotten narrower and longer. Right. And so now we go from uh, three, six. So now we've got 90 B front to back. So just by lengthening, lengthening that line a little bit, we've eliminated 3 dB of, of level variance and our low frequency. So that's that's the mechanism. Um, now it's still not making the same shape that our high frequencies are making. So we've got some ways to go, but sure. you'll notice we've got this little figure eight shape here. Um, the figure eight shape is a really nice kind of milestone when we're talking about line length, because the figure eight shape means that the line length is the same as the wavelength we're looking at. Um, so it's a kind of a nice milestone, right? So again, six, six boxes, 125 Hertz, 125 Hertz is about eight feet long. This is about an eight foot line. And so I can tell you that's an eight foot line just by seeing the shape that it's making and knowing that we're looking at 125 Hertz. I don't need to go and look at the dimensions of the box to see that. Right. So is that the, the, the narrowest shape I could get my array to make is that figure eight when it's equal to line length? Uh, we can get more narrow as we're going to see, but the, the thing we're kind of standing on the corner here is if, if, if we go to lower frequencies here, um, those frequencies have wavelengths that are longer than the line. We're going to see it to become more and more omnidirectional like the last slide. And as we go above this frequency, we're going to see more and more of that concentration behavior. So this is sort of where we sort of cross the corner into the saying, yeah, we have some amount of directional control. If you were to measure that, it'd be 72 degrees, if you care, right? <laughs> that's, yep. uh, so that's so that's where that number comes from. And that's we're starting to get some control now based on the line length. So let's make the line longer. Here's 12 boxes. So we've doubled it again. And now you can see that that shape we're making is starting to become a really good fit for yeah. the shape that we want our high frequencies to make, right? Love it. And yeah. so... You know, the other thing to think about is, of course, the geometry of the seating area will change from day to day if you're on tour. Um, but the thing that we're looking at here is that, hey, line length is a design parameter. You know, a lot of people think of it as, well, it's going to be this long because this is how many boxes I have. But when you're at the design stage and you're choosing how many boxes you have or choosing how long the line should be, um, thinking of it as a design parameter, you can say, well, what is, what is an appropriate line length based on the coverage I'm trying to create? And so that's really what we're thinking about here. Um, so this is 100, this is 125 hertz, 12 boxes. You can see that now we're starting to really narrow that beam down and it's starting to become a better shape for uh, the coverage angle that our high frequencies are going to fill as well. Um, and here's 16 boxes. There's the full shebang. So now we're in a really nice spot. So now if you look at your, if you look at your level variance, you know, we're kind of if you mix positions here, you're, you're basically plus three up and you're uh, losing maybe three back from mixed position to get all the way up to the back. So we're plus or minus three, plus or minus four. Um, and line length is how that's working. We haven't done any tuning or steering or anything yet. That's just the, the physics of, of that line. So is that plus or minus three, is that a good, like if you walk into the design stage, is that a good parameter that you're looking for from like a total total balance perspective? I, I think that's a, that's a, uh, it's a, it's an admirable goal. It's not always an, a reasonable goal. Like a, I think if you went out and measured a hundred arena shows, I don't think 95 of them would, would land in plus minus three. Um, so that's a point where, where it is achievable as we're going to see it is absolutely achievable given the resources, like you said, because at the end of the day, yeah. I don't get to pick how many boxes we have. I don't get to pick how much truck space we have. I don't get to pick how much weight the ceiling can hold. Yep. So we always have, external factors that are going to put limitations on our design and what it's going to do. But if we can get it to a point where it's plus or minus three or plus or minus four, what you've created is a very perceptually consistent system. And you can, you can say with good confidence that, yeah, regardless if you're in the front, you're in the back, you're going to have a very similar listening experience. And that's, that's sort of the goal. Um, now, you know, I, I think, I think that also there's some, there's some context that we need to think about here. So if we're doing a shed and there's a lawn, 
I don't want the lawn to be as loud as, as loud as the front row, probably, you know, those people are in picnic blankets back there and the people in the front row really want that front row rock concert experience. So we're trying to create two different experiences. So, so saying we don't want any variants might not be appropriate. Um, if you think about something like a, a house of worship, you know, a lot of people will self select the experience that they want. So they may choose to sit closer to the front if they want a louder and more kind of uh, immersive and tactile experience. And they may choose to sit further back if they don't want it to be as loud. Um, so if we design a system that has no variance, you've sort of uh, taken away that choice from people and they don't really have the ability to self-select anymore. So, so we don't always want to try to eliminate the variance, but we want to try to control it. I love so it. yeah, I, I, I think that's a design goal, right? We want to decide going in, mm-hmm. what do we want the variance to look like? And then we design a system that's going to do that. And I love how you anchor the presentation and what was the goal from the artist and the director from this tour and approaching every project. Like, what is the goal of this system? That is definitely going to change the design decisions that you're making. So I love that it's rooted in how you're serving your, your clients from the get-go. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I did a house of worship design a couple of months ago. And, and one of the first things we talked about was, what do you want the level variance to be? Between the front and the back, do you want it the same on the way back? You probably don't. Do you... Do you want to let it roll off towards the back because that's where maybe you've got some older folks who aren't as comfortable or they've got young children, right? And they don't, they don't want to be up in the front where it's loud. Where's it being mixed from, right? Those are all things that we want to talk about. Um, if you've got, so it's six, it's 60 B up in the front, but the mix is in the back and you think it's a comfortable level at mixed. That means it's comfortable plus six in the, in the front, right? <laughs> so, so all of these things are things that we want to take into our decision-making process when we approach the design and that. have an idea for what we want that variance to do. Perfect. All right. Keep trucking. This is awesome. Great. So let's just take a note. Again, we're sort of talking about the physics of how our sources interact. And you can take a line that is this long out of anybody's box, make a line this length, and you're going to see a very similar shape at low frequencies. Um, and so this is not about number of boxes. It's about the length of the line. That's an important distinction. So you could use 24 mm-hmm. of a smaller box and make the same shape, okay? Um, now, obviously, that doesn't mean all speakers are created equal. That's silly. But but the mechanic that's driving this shape is the length of the line in relationship to the frequencies that we're looking at. And you'll see, I should put the red arrow here, that center axis of that low frequency lobe is always going to come out. It's going to emanate from the geometric center of your array. Mm -hmm. So you can see that that's, you know, 16 boxes. So between box eight and nine, that's where that thing is, is, is aimed. Um, And, and if you think about the shape that our high frequencies are going to make when we get the high frequencies going. um, So let's splay this out now. Let's splay this out. So our high frequency coverage is, is what we want. So there's our splay angles. And we've opened our splays up, so we're getting closer down to the front, and we're getting all the way up to the back. And that's where that high-frequency lobe still is going to come out the center, the geometric center of that array. Now, this is not the shape we want to make, because it's not the shape the high frequencies are going to make. So the high frequencies, we're hoping they're going to be consistent all the way up to the back. But we can see that once we get past mix, our low frequencies start falling off pretty quickly. And I see three color transitions between mix and the back row. Yep. And this right here is why a lot of arena shows sound really light in the back rows because the low frequency coverage doesn't make it that far, even though the high frequency coverage does. So the question is, can we steer that up? And this is where I talked about manufacturers are starting to pay attention to this issue and they have different technologies that are designed to steer that up. Today, we're looking at Meyer loudspeakers. So Meyer has what they call low mid beam control and it does this, right? You can tip that beam upwards. And so now it's a much better fit uh, for the seating area. So now you see that, from mix, everybody's in the same 3 dB color. And then we're kind of gaining, we're getting a little bit as we go forward. And so now we have we have a very good starting point for a, a system that's going to be consistent over the space. Can you give just like a, explain it like I'm five, like what is the actual processing under the hood that's making it steer? Just the timing relationships and like what, what's sure. happening? Sure. I mean, are you familiar with a delayed arc subarray where we have a line of subs mm-hmm. and you would add a little bit of delay towards the top and you bend that beam up or if the subs are on the ground, you'd you know bend the beam out. Yeah. So slight timing differences between elements. So basically, you, you know, we're talking about changing the relative arrival times at points in space, right? Yep. So the thing is that we can't use that trick on a full range loudspeaker yep. because subs only cover an octave and a half 
uh, full range loudspeaker covers seven or eight octaves. And so a little bit of timing that's going to just give you just enough steering at 125 is going to cause absolute mayhem at your higher frequencies. Yep. And so you're using a variety of different technologies that allow us to manipulate the timing or the phase of the, just the low mid frequencies without messing the stuff above that, the way Myers works. And we'll see this uh, as we look at the processing, I think in, in the next video, um, they use all pass filters that are staggered just a little bit to kind of manipulate the phase from element to element. There's other variations that use FIR filtering, but what we're doing is we're very, very subtly manipulating um, the arrival times of the energy in that low mid region. And and that allows us to sort of shape that coverage and steer it where we want to go. Perfect. I don't know. I'm not sure if a five-year-old would have followed that explanation, to be honest with you, but it seems like you did. <laughs> so, well, I'm so 31, so hopefully. <laughs> hopefully that hopefully that's helpful to people. And that's great. You know, by the way, Meyer has a video on LNBC. Low that's right. They, they have do. a video on how it works. Uh, I know the DNB has a video on, on their array processing algorithm. Um, which, which does a couple things, but one of the things it does is addresses this particular thing that we're talking about. Um, L Acoustics just recently introduced what they call the full range auto filter. And again, it is targeted at, at the same issue of steering that low mid lobe where we want it to go. So, so all the manufacturers are approaching this a little bit differently, but the, the concept is the same and they all have resources on how they're doing that. So I would encourage anyone that's interested in this to check those resources out. Love it. So, that's the line length. The other thing that I mentioned was processing granularity. Um, and, and so we're going to break our array up into, into segments and we're going to be able to adjust the high frequency typically. You know, besides the beam steering stuff we just looked at, the other advantage here is the boxes that are at the top of the array, they're throwing the farthest, they're going to have the most air absorption. We're probably going to want to boost their high frequency a little bit. The down at the bottom of the array, they're very close to the listeners and they're probably going to sound a bit bright because they don't have all that air absorption. There's proximity there. So we want to probably take the high frequency down on those boxes. So we want to be able to go within the array and just make these small adjustments to the high frequency or the term that we use is shading. Um, and, and so the more granularity we have in the processing, the smoother we can make that. Maybe you only have three zones and I've got, you know, the bottom five and then the middle five and then the top five or whatever. And so I've got a front of house zone, I've got a close zone and then I've got a, a far zone. Um, the problem you're going to run into there is that when we go to tune it, if I take my top, my top row and I go, I need to go plus four and my front of house is at zero and my bottom zone is at minus four. I'm, as I walk the floor, I'm going to hit a seam where I've gone from zero dB to minus four. And I go back and I've gone from zero to plus four. So you hear this, you, this high frequency edge and it actually causes like little stair steps in the tonality where you take, you go up three rows and it got a lot brighter. And so by dividing our array into smaller and smaller zones, and like I said, typically on a modern system by a major manufacturer, we're talking about one or two, two elements really um, is where it's sort of landed. Sometimes three, we have the ability to be more granular and more gradual with those filters and make it a smoother listening experience. So, so those two things together, the line length and the processing granularity are our major tools for approaching low variance. It, it's funny that we're actually wanting less efficiency in that standpoint in boxes. Cause I see some manufacturers like, man, you could fit like 18 boxes in one amp channel. I'm like, that's all cool, but I need more control, please. <laughs> right. And for a while it was a value proposition and how cheap yes. can it be? Yeah. Um, because I mean, let's be honest. And that's why I started by saying this is an artist directive, which means the artist yeah. has said, we're willing to pay for this. We're willing yep. to pay for more PA. We're willing to pay for someone who's got a high level of knowledge about the design and the tuning and the processing and, and you know, pay for more processing, pay for more amplifiers, however that works on your system. Sure. And it's an excellent point. Um, this is not cheaper. <laughs> you know, it is an investment, but it is an investment yeah. because the, yeah. the, the end of the day, uh, these bands have people who are, putting concert videos on YouTube and on Snapchat and people on Twitter and it's on the internet and you want those videos to sound good. Yep. So having your show sound good at mix position is not enough in the mm. modern age. We want it to sound good for all the listeners and we want it to sound good for all the people who are going to see that video online and go, wow, that show sounds great. I'll buy tickets to that show sure. versus well, that show sounds terrible. I don't think I want to buy tickets to that show. So what we're starting to see is artists realizing this is a long play. And that it. making an investment to have their, their show always be to that standard, regardless of what ticket the person bought, uh, that's a, that's a long-term investment. So, so you're right. It is, it is, uh, it is not cheaper to do this, but it, but it is depending on the artist, it can very well be a, a, a wise long-term investment. Sure. All right, let's keep moving. 
Cool. So here's our mains design. We're going to kind of keep coming back to this uh, screenshot here. So again, what I've done is we've taken the uh, those Leo boxes. I believe that's 16 of them, uh, and they're right now they're just hanging out in the space. And as we as we design the next elements of our system, we're going to kind of come back and insert them into this model. So you'll be able to see how we end up with what we end up with. So there's our mains. Very good. Uh, let's talk about subs. So same thing, right? Now same idea, longer wavelength. Um, and there's a single sub at 50 Hertz. And as you can see, if we hung this underneath the mains that we just put, uh, the bottom octave of our system would not have that, that, uh, you know, that nice uniformity that our, that our, the rest of our system is going to have. Now the bottom octave is going to get really loud as we, as we get front. So we're back to having a lot of level variance here. Mm -hmm. Um, and because this is a part of a full range system, that means that in turn, we are back to having spectral variance as well. Um, now, if your subs are on the ground, you've experienced this. It's louder <laughs> as you get closer to it, and there's really not much to be done about it. So yeah. uh, the really the most important thing you can do for uniformity is to get those subs off the ground, get them yeah. up into the air. And in a smaller venue, that's not always a realistic option. But when you get into you know the arena and the touring world, um, the, you know obviously those tools are meant to be flown. That, that, mm -hmm. that exists. And the other thing that, that we're talking about, and it's not a topic for today's discussion, but we are learning that those people who are right up in the front next to the barricade, next to all those subs, there is a, a hearing health risk there too for those people because it's a very, very high level of low frequency energy that's hitting those people. So by getting that sub up in the air, um, we, we sort of start to solve both of those problems. There's one sub, 50 hertz. We need to, we need to again, we're going to lengthen our vertical line, right? Yeah. See if we can kind of compress that yeah. down. There's seven. So now we're making a nice little donut. Yeah. Now the thing we've got to remember here is we're looking at a 2D prediction, right? So yeah. we're actually looking at a donut from the side so it's not just going forward and back it's going left it's going right um so this doesn't you know if we look at it top down it's still a circle but what we're talking about is vertical plane here we see that we're starting to send that energy forward um and less going up and less going down so you see that we've now started to get some of the energy off the floor and less on the ceiling yeah. and, and we're starting to bend it forward um the sub design on this particular tour was two of those seven box hangs um, in, in, a, in an end fire configuration. So they're not cardioid. We don't have a polarity inversion here. Excuse me, they're not, they're not gradient cardioid. Mm -hmm. um, we are making a cardioid shape in that it's got more energy towards the front and less energy towards the rear, but we're not doing a gradient array. It's just that the downstage array is delayed. And so it's the way you would build an end fire array. It only has two elements in it, uh, it's, but it's, it's an, it is an end fire array. I believe our spacing was four feet from center to center. Right. Um, the cool thing about this is that they're hung from a truss together and we travel with that truss and the rigging stays on the truss. So I know that the spacing between those subs is going to be consistent when we hang it every day. So I don't need to retime the steering of this sub array every day because it always hangs in the same or placement relative to itself. Nice. So again, we, uh, you can see we're starting to get a little more directionality there. And the thing that people often don't realize about a large format sound system is that your mains have energy in the sub range. So if you're used yeah. to clubs and small house of worship, you used to, oh, my subs are from 100 hertz down and my mains are from 100 hertz up. And that's great. When you get into a larger format system, those mains extend down to 60, 50, 40, some of them even to 35, right? So we have that extension, which means we have to think about our mains as part of our sub design. They're not separate. Yeah. They are contributing energy in that and that frequency range. So when we add our we add our main hang in, and we end up with something like this. And this is the shape now that we make. So we see that that main has even further contributed to that steering. And so now, if you think about where mix would be, everybody from mix back is basically you know about three dB, four dB down from there. Um, yeah. So you can see that this is now a three element end fire array, even though there's only two hangs of subs in it, right? So so if you yeah. picture what does this look like from above. If you look, think about the top down view, it's three elements front to back and they're timed as such, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And, and tell me about the, the little upward staggering. Is that to further help kind of shoot the arrow to the top row? So there's a couple things going on with that. Obviously, if you think about where the acoustic centers of those, mm -hmm. of those hangs are, it's going to kind of tip it up a little bit more. Now, that's only a one foot stagger. So your mains, if your mains are at 48, your subs are at 47 and your rear subs are at 46. It's only a one foot stagger. Um, it decreased the energy at monitor world a little bit. 
Okay. A so little we, bit. We can look them in the eye on tour and not just the hate our guts because they're getting 50 hertz every night. Yeah. And, and there was a discussion with the monitor engineer about that. Are you getting the energy you need back here? Are you getting too much? Are you not yep. getting enough? Again, the band wants to feel it on stage. So if the monitor engineer is not feeling any of that, the monitor mm-hmm. engineer is not cueing accurately to what the artists are experiencing. Yep. Um, so part of this is that I did have a conversation with the monitor engineer and say, is this, are we on the right track? Do you need more? Do you need less? And then we're going to obviously affect the things that we're trying to do with the tuning to see if we can give him more or less. Um, and that's why it's not a gradient cardioid because we could, we could be very, very clean behind with a gradient array. Um, and that's yep. one of the reasons we're not using a gradient array is because we don't necessarily want that. Um, right. So, so that's part of it. Uh, the other part of it is practical. And this is something a lot of people don't think about when those arrays fly and when they come down at the end of the night, the tilt reduced the amount of juggling carts that my PA techs had to do. So it just helped us get the show out faster. Um, and, and, you know, making it efficient is, is important. Um, and I also thought it looked cool, you know, when they, when they were, when they were testing the rigging out, they, they had just put the chains up and they said, what do you think about this? You know, we didn't level it yet. We were just testing it. You know, is this cool? I was like, I, I think we should leave that. It looks neat. And I did look at the predictions and I said, yeah, I like what this is doing. So um, cool. a nice benefit of this is that when I, when I see photos of this band, you know, on the internet or whatever, I can spot whether or not it was one of my shows because it's got the stagger in there. Oh, I love so. it. Very cool. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I so love yeah, there, there, there are, there are a couple of reasons for the stagger, um, but it's really amazing how many people asked about it. So, you know, if that's going to generate some dialogue and some interest into, into this type of work, then I'm all for it. So Welcome if you got it, man, uh, come on. We're building awareness, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's, so this is sort of what we, what we settled on and what we've got here is, is a, a good start towards controlling those lower frequencies um, that you just don't have if you've got all your subs on the ground, right? Um, so we're using we're using some directionality to to start working towards uniformity. So if we revisit this now, let's add our subs in. Uh, there we go. Very nice. So now our now our rig is taking shape here. Um, okay. So uh, if we look at the and and I also want to say this, we're talking about a band in particular that's been doing arena shows for a long time, and so part of coming into that is not starting from scratch and not reinventing the wheel. And they say, we, we have a sub configuration that, that we like. Um, and their front of house engineer was their systems engineer for a long time. So he's spent a lot of time thinking about how this should be designed. And so this is an example of, we have this, this is working. This is what was spec. I'm not going to come in and just say, well, let's do something else. If I know that they're happy with, with, with what they're doing. So, so part of my job coming into this is to be fresh eyes and say, we, we want to go for excellence. We've, you know, they said we we're happy with what we're getting, but we think you can, you can make it better. You know, can you come in and look at this as someone who hasn't been with this act for 12 years and be the fresh eyes and, and figure out what we want to do differently. So, so that sub array was something that they've been doing and they were happy with. So that's part of the reason that we're doing that is because it was there. This, I added the stagger because <laughs> I like the stagger. So um, it's dumb. now this is, this is one of those things here that, that we're talking about. Let's, let's find some, places to make improvements. Um, so what we're looking at here is, is what we call plan view. So it's a top down view of an arena. Uh, this is a 3D model that we can see here. And we're looking at four kilohertz. We're looking at the mains at four kilohertz. And you can see I've got this triangle down here on the bottom. And so that triangle is a bunch of people who are outside the coverage of that main hang. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's two things that we want to look at here. Number one is that triangle is there's, you know, there's 1500 seats in that triangle, give or take. And we got to cover those because people bought tickets in those. So we need to start talking about a side hang. Um, the other thing is if we look up in the corners, we see that our mains are getting energy back there, but that's where it gets the lightest. That, that corner there is the lightest, typically one of the harder places to cover in an arena. Um, if you really want to cover it, the answer is you need to hang in a delay. Uh, but a lot of tours, that's just not a reasonable thing to do. Um, so is there anything that we can do with what we're hanging by the stage to, to help that corner out? Um, and so those are two things that I was focused on making improvements on as I sort of inherited this design and wanted to kind of innovate it a little bit more. And, and, you know, like I said, you know, see where, see where improvements can be made. And this is one of the things I was looking at. Um, so let's start with a side hang and this is, uh, 20 boxes of, of lion. Now that's a lot of, that's a lot of side hang. Um, yeah. So, so there's a couple of reasons why. Number one is 20 boxes of line will make about the same line length as the mains. Mm. Um, so again, 
I think a, a risk here is that often we specify how many boxes based on the SPL we're trying to hit. And we don't think about consistency. We don't think about the line length. We don't think about the vertical angle. So a really simple example, if you have 40, 45 degrees of vertical angle to cover, you have a 15 degree element, people go, I need three. Yeah, you need three. And then you can't use any splay angle at all to approach the variance situation. You have to open everything up all the way. So you've, you've basically, you know, that was an expensive point source that you've created. Um, so just put a 45 degree box up if that's the, right. So, so yeah. maybe that'll get you to SPL, but I'm still going to ask you for six boxes or for eight boxes, even though three at full open will cover it. Cause just covering it's not optimal. We're talking about how can we actually cover it consistently? Yep. So more boxes than you need for SPL uh, the line length is consistent. There's another reason here with the side hangs. And that is because if you think about the shape that side hangs make, and this is an area where 3D modeling is really helpful um, because 2D modeling doesn't really show you the angle. It's kind of, it's not, it's not a, it's not a perpendicular angle where your side hangs are aiming into the arena. Mm. If we go back, um, we can see, let's go back to the, the slide here. You can see that that's kind of coming in at a 45 degree angle where that side hang is going to aim. Or I think we were like 52, 53 degrees on most days. So modeling that accurately, you have a seating geometry where from the point of view of that side hang, the seats on the right side are much closer than the seats on the left side. So you've got listeners that are 20 feet away from this thing. And on the other edge of the same box, they're 110 feet away. So you have a very weird aspect ratio, both vertically and horizontally. And so we're going to talk about what we're doing in the horizontal plane to help that. But vertically speaking, having more angles to articulate will allow us to make a smoother transition from those people who are down at the bottom and are very, very close to the people who are up at the top and, and really need a lot of output. So having more boxes in your side hang is a really good way to help yourself, you know, give your, yourself a tool set to be able to achieve that, that consistency. I love it. That's okay. super helpful. You looked very thoughtful. I wasn't sure if you had a question. No, no, no. Like, <laughs> dig, breathing it all in, man. Uh, oh, yeah. So, so let's talk again about this corner, right? Uh, you can see that there there is an under coverage there, and it is it does sound a little light. Now, I'm not worried about that over towards the middle because over towards the middle, we're going to start getting energy from the other side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not going to sound light at mixed position, but it will sound light up in this corner. Um, and again, we're talking about four kilohertz. So this is your vocal intelligibility. This is an important region of energy that we really want to make sure we're covering properly. Um, and so one of the things that we had was that side hang, where it was, it was the lion box, which is the second largest format in that series. Um, and there's two varieties of that box that we use on this tour. There's with the lion M and there's a the lion W. The W is a wider pattern. And almost always those wides end up at the bottom of a hang because people think, well, it's, you know, it's like a downfill. They're, they're closer. We need, to, we need to have a wider box down there so we can keep that pattern open on the floor. And that's true. But if we look at the geometry of what's happening here, the bottom of our main hang um, is covering well over into where it's overlapping the bottom of the side hang. So we don't need to be super wide at the bottom of our side hang because we have overlap at the bottom box of the mains there. Um, so we're not going to have a hole where we need to have that extra wide box, but we do sort of want more width at the top. So I said, let's put those wide boxes at the top of the side hang. And the crew thought it was a little goofy at first for suggesting that, but, you know, I looked at yeah. the prediction and I, and I showed our front of house engineer the prediction. And what we discovered is it's not just a little better. It's a lot better. So here's, here's with the wides on the bottom and there's the wides on the top. So you can see that our uniformity wow. has drastically increased, right? Um, and, and so that really brings us a lot closer to where we wanna be and in that corner uh, where, those, where the main and the side are overlapping, that corner cleaned up a lot and we were able to get more energy up there. Um, so we was that the, three? Was that three up? Four, it's four, four on okay. the top. Yep, nice. so the, the top four were, were wide. Now, the thing is we don't hang 20 every day. Sure. A lot of times you hang 16. Sometimes you hang 12. We look at the geometry every day. This is part of the part of the work, right? Yep. You go into the venue in the morning. If you don't have a model, you make a model. You do your work with your laser. You do your work with your right triangle calculator if you need to. And you figure out what the best solution is. Uh, and so a lot of times 12 boxes or 16 boxes gave us the coverage that we wanted. And so that's what we do. So we're not always hanging 20, but once we put those four wides on the top, they stayed there for the rest of the tour because that was, that was always the best move that, that always uh, did what we wanted it to do. Um, 
Very cool. And, you know, there's another conversation to be had here about not making your crew repeat work, right? So Mm -hmm. having them move those frames every day and stuff like that. That's why we try to keep it to to four boxes if we can. Uh, 13 might be a little better than 12, but now they've got to split a cart and now it's, it's a lot of manual labor and they've got to go find somewhere to put this cart with three speakers on it backstage. And so, so you have to sort of weigh that is, is, is that one DB of improvement worth the disruption and worth the fact that it's going to take longer to get up in the air. And then maybe I might not have as much time to tune it. And so that we might actually not end up with a better result if it's cutting into my tuning time or cutting into my listening time, um, those types of things. So again, this part of the job is to just make a judgment call. Um, so even when we're doing shorter side hangs, we still had the wides on the top and we found that that really uh, helped out a lot. Right. Very cool. And how many, uh, did you do that from the start of the tour? Did you get a couple in and were like, wait a minute, can I do this? We were, we were a couple in because I think the reality of this is, you know, as great as prediction is once it's up and you're actually listening to the show and you're walking around and you're seeing how it's, how it's reacting when you have these people in the room, that's when you really know. Um, where you want to focus on for the next time. So I think we were probably three or four shows in when I said, I think we can, you know, make an improvement here. And part of this is mindset. Part of this is saying, I'm understanding the tools that we have, literally what's on the truck. And is there a better way to rearrange these tools to get what we want? Um, So that was not an initial design thing. It was something that once the rig was up and we were doing shows on the rig and I was walking and measuring and listening to it. And I said, I think we can use the available tools in a better way um, because like we got overlap down here that I don't need. And we've got to, you know, with that could be better used somewhere else. So, so that's part of, that's part of the work is not just going, ah, it's fine. Let's just hang that again. But you know, is there, is there a way to be better? And that's the whole reason I was hired in, on this particular show was what they were doing was already very good, yeah. but it was, can it be better? And so, that was my job is, is can it be better? So yeah, I'm, I'm, I was constantly tweaking and making improvements. And I think as we get into the following videos, we talked about the, the tuning process a little bit. We've got some more examples of that where, where we said, hey, because we've got some interesting things that are happening today with this, let's do this. This might be a little bit better today. Wonderful. Let's talk about fills. Cool. So fills are interesting. As you can see, we've got a sort of an interesting stage geometry here. Um, and And this immediately complicates the act of putting front fills across the edge of your stage because you have a stage geometry where you're going to end up with, if you do that, you're going to fills firing through each other. Um, and, and that becomes a, a kind of a mess from a timing perspective. Um, you've got to think about the height of the stage and these risers out here at the end are eight foot risers. So you can't put a front fill on that because it's going to go at everybody's head. Um, so we immediately have some geometric challenges here. And so we've got, we've got a little bit of a 3d puzzle that we need to fill in. So the first uh, thing we do is sort of, boil this design down and say, let's, let's look at what we have. So that we've got red and we've got blue here. The red is our, as our front fill. Um, the trickiest part of this was what I'm calling the armpit of the stage. So that little kind of corner between the stage and the inner, then the inner thrust there. Oh, wow. um, that is, that is where you're going to have the hardest time covering because you're, you know, you're the furthest away from your main hangs there. And so that's where your center gap is, is really going to, be an issue. You don't have anybody in the middle because there's a thrust there. No one's listening from where the thrust is. So right in the middle, those people are pushed back 38 feet or whatever it is. But that that little corner was a tricky part. So we started with a, a little point source array of JM1 P's in there. And we said, we'll put them on a road case and that the driver will be just above head height. And that'll give us a nice little fan of coverage that's very easy to keep timed well because it's all coming from one source. Yep. Um, and then we, we took, uh, these are lions that were placed on the deck that kind of went around the edge. Uh, to kind of fill in the rest. So if we predict that, this is just the three JM1 piece. And you can see that, again, it does make a nice little kind of consistent fan that is really the most critical part of coverage. And when we add in the rest of the fills, there you have it. Nice. Um, That's great. Yeah. And and so unfortunately, as is the nature of live events, when you get into production and, you know, even though everyone said, yeah, this is cool. We think this is good. Because remember, we've got lighting. They want to put pictures on the deck. We've got video. We've got set pieces. So we can't always all do everything that we want to do. We need to understand what the other departments are doing. So this is a situation where because of things that happen in other departments and because of people adapting and changing their show to make it work, we could no longer put boxes on the deck. Right. So we got vetoed. Um, (laughs) So, so now we're out in tech and we say, what do we do with what we have available? Um, We can have carpenting, the carpenter folks make us, uh, some brackets there. We can hang the fills off the edge of the deck. Um, problem with that is we can't use alliance 
because it's too heavy for the weight rating of this bracket. Yeah. Right. Uh, so the thing is, even though uh, a single leopard box is, this is going to be a leopard is significantly lower SPL than the, than the Leo. I think it's like 90 B down uh, eight or 90 B down. So now we're talking about using a product that does not have as much SPL. We're going to have to drive it harder, but it fits and physically fits. It's mm. physically safe to put it where we want it. And that always has to win, right? It, it's yep. going to be safe and it's going to fit and we can get those. So now we replace that. Our JM1Ps are relegated to uh, sort of the side uh, fill out here. So there are going to be some days where they've sold a little bit past 180. So those folks are out of the coverage of our side hang. If we had a lot of those shows, we would carry a 270 hang, but you know it's one or two. So we can use our JM1Ps and we can cover those folks. So then we end up with something like this. So you can see that we are not at the uniformity that we had with the, the thing that we actually designed. But this is a typical example of we've got to figure out what tools are available and we've got mm -hmm. to do what we can with these tools. So yep. I end up with a, with a, a, a tip fill at the end of the thrust. And then we've got sort of the armpit and then we've got the, you know, the, the far, further out of the off stage. So that's, that'll be five total, right? So it's four plus the one at the tip. So it's, it's uh, that's five, that's five uh, leopard boxes. And those are going to be our front fills. Plus we've got those jam one P's to wheel out as needed. Um, so this those... is the fill design that we end up with. And those JMPs on their side and then coupled? They are vertically arrayed. So there's, yeah. there's three, they're side by side, but this is the speaker is oh, upright. Oh, so three. Yeah, I see that now. Yep. Great. Yep, there's three of them in there. Yep. Um, and this is what the fill looks like when it's on the, the bracket. The uh, carp department was calling these toilet seats uh, for obvious <laughs> reasons. So, so there you have it. Now, one thing that's not in this picture that I just want to, I want to point out, we took bright pink tape and made bright X's on top of those fills because we want it to be clear to the artist don't stand on this. It's not designed to hold you, right? <laughs> so if you find some photos of the tour from folks that are higher up and kind of we're looking down into the stage, you can very clearly see there's some bright X's yes. on those fills. And that's a safety thing. Yeah. We don't want anybody to try to put weight on that, you know, because, you know, rock stars sometimes like to stand on things that they shouldn't stand on. And this is a situation where we cannot make that rated to hold a person. So we need to make it clear, don't stand on this. So now we've got, we've got these lions that are no longer being used as front fills. And so what I said is, well, I'm going to make some down fills. Nice. So when we put these on the bottom of the mains, and the cool thing about this is that the, the Leo box is a large format cabinet. The most we can display it is five degrees. And so when we're talking about trying to get all the way down to the front, um, and this is one of the things now that's always important is making sure your mains cover as far down as you can. But now it's more important because we do not any longer have this optimal front fill design mm. and it's not the coverage that we designed. So it becomes more important for our mains to be able to get as far down towards that barricade as possible. So I'm really trying to design every day to get that mains all the way down to the barricade. Can't always do it yep. because as you curve that array more, the center of gravity moves upstage. And you can see the pink line there. It's towards the back end of the frame. So your, your rear motor starts taking all the weight. Um, so you got to watch out with weight distribution. If you curve enough, that center of gravity falls outside the frame and you can't hang it like that um, without a pullback. But then we've got subs in the way. So, so you get as much curvature as you can. One of the things that helped out there is using the line, which is a lighter box and can splay open wire. It can splay all the way to nine. Okay. So three of those lines down there, typically I had them at 799 or 779. So you're talking about 25 degrees of extra coverage by just three more boxes on there. Nice. And that's a that's definitely a, a, a trade-off that you want to take. And that's also, by the way, that's part of why the trim heights are a little bit lower on this tour than you might typically see uh, for this type of rig in an arena. Um, because as you fly higher, you have to tip the array down more. And that takes your center of gravity further back since we don't have a pullback. Uh, flying a little bit lower means that I can tip up more and it allowed me to kind of manipulate the weight loading on the motors to make sure that I could get further down towards the front. So, so the trim height actually informs uh, me being able to get energy all the way down to the barricade in some of these cases. And that's a couple of people are like, that's an interesting trim height. And that's part of why it's, it's all the mechanics of the coverage. Yeah. And, and what was your average trim height just for fun? Uh, I would say on average, we were probably between 47 and 50 feet, which is, a little bit lower than typical. It's not, it's not crazy low. Um, you know, some of these shows, you know, we could fly higher and we could go to 65. Uh, and some of them, some of them we had to fly quite low because we had, we had, you know, ceiling limitations. And there were some days we were 38 and so you're hanging shorter lines. Um, and we'll look at one of those special cases uh, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, in a future conversation for right. sure.
So, uh, so, so the downfills allow us to cover a lot of ground. 25 degrees of splay at the bottom is a lot of splay. We can really cover a lot of ground down there without significantly making our line longer, significantly making it heavier. I mean, to get 25 degrees out of Leo's, you need five of them. So, yeah. so putting, putting those downfills in is, becomes a, a really nice utility and uh, it's definitely uh, an improvement. So if we revisit our design now, there we have our downfills, our side hangs, and our subs. So there, there's our flown system. Um, and I think that's that's the, the nutshell version of the design and kind of how, how it landed where it did. Um, so, so hopefully uh, we've sort of set the table for ourselves to have you know, a consistent uh, and uniform system. I love it. Thank you so much for, for sharing that, Michael. Looking forward to next week, we're going to talk about how you wrangled this PA every day and how you lined out your processing. But uh, make sure to be on the lookout for Michael's book. We're going to have that at his link tree link below. It's going to be coming out pretty soon. So keep your ear to the ground for that. I've, I had the privilege of having her early release coffee and ate it up. It was amazing. So again, thank you, Michael. And we'll catch you on the next video. Thank you.